Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to have you here. Welcome to the um, last session before the closing ceremony of Wikimania 2022. I'm super excited to be here. Super happy to have you all here. Um, even though I have no idea who you are because I don't see anything thanks to the virtual event. Um, we want to talk about wiki functions. I will give a very short introduction into wiki functions before I let my team talk about it. I uh, have um, a few fantastic speakers who will talk about different aspects of wiki functions, and then we'll go to a Q&A session at the end. What is wiki functions? Wiki functions will be a new project of the uh, Wikimedia movement, the first one in almost a decade to start. Um, we um, it's a wiki for functions and functions can do things like calculate things um, add information to existing data and so on so um, to, to give examples of functions is for example given a date um, of birth you can calculate um, the age of a person or given um, uh, population and an area, you can calculate density of the, of, of the place and so on. And all of these things can then also be used in the Wikipedias and kept up to date, for example, based on data and Wikidata. So we can draw the population directly from Wikidata, make a calculation on it and display that in the Wikipedias. This way we can keep more information, more data up to date, um, and, um, share it also across the different, uh, language editions of Wikipedia. So um, you can call those functions inside from the wiki. You will be able to call those functions inside of the Wikipedia, so the other Wikimedia projects. You will call those, be able to call these functions in other modalities, like just the wiki functions directly itself. Our plan is to keep working on it. We just uh, launched our beta version. Um, we're not there yet to really kick off and launch wiki functions there. We'll do it when we're ready. I hope this will happen in the not too far future, uh, but I don't want to commit on a date, but um, just make sure that we are getting actually to a point where we are satisfied with the products that you can launch. We will start launch with a small product, just as we did with Wikidata um, a decade ago. So it won't have all the functionalities yet, but we rather will grow then over the months and years to add more functionalities and to allow for more um, possibilities of wiki functions. So we will start with a very minimal project. It won't be integratable into Wikipedia as yet, it, um, and all of this. But um, we'll, it will show it will show you the first direction of where we're going to go. One of the main goals of wiki functions is to also provide functions that generate natural language text. That natural language text is then um, meant to be a foundation, a baseline of knowledge that will be available in all the different languages of, uh, of the Wikipedias, so that we can write an article in an abstract notation, this is where the word abstract Wikipedia comes from, abstracting from a natural language and translating it into natural languages through those functions and wiki functions and make it available in the 300 or more languages that Wikipedia supports. So this is the rough idea. This is the, uh, the goal. Um, I'm very happy now to uh, let the team members speak on certain aspects of wiki functions. And I'll see you after that for a Q&A. If you can roll the video, please. Thank you.
Hi everyone, I'm James Forrester. I'm the lead engineer for Abstract Wikipedia team, working on Wiki functions. I've been a staff member for 10 years and a volunteer for 20 years on the Wikimedia projects, and I've been working on Abstract Wikipedia since we started in 2020. So an overview of the technology is that we've kind of split the code into two parts. There is the bit that you interact with directly that displays your functions, your test cases, your implementations, and your discussions about whether this is Hi everyone, I'm James Forrester. I'm the lead engineer for Abstract Wikipedia team, working on Wiki functions. I've been a staff member for 10 years and a volunteer for 20 years on the Wikimedia projects. And I've been working on Abstract Wikipedia since we started in 2020. So an overview of the technology is that we've kind of split the code into two parts. There is the bit that you interact with directly that displays your functions, your test cases, your implementations, and your discussions about whether this is a good idea, your community forum, all that stuff. All of that's in MediaWiki. All of that is um, hopefully as uh, familiar as possible within the confines of it being a totally new form of content for community members to be working on. And then on the back end, we have services that actually take your code and run it based on requests. So the front end is a MediaWiki extension, Wiki Lambda, which was uh, the first kind of code name for the, the project before Wiki Functions was community picked as, as the project name. The Wiki Lambda code is a MediaWiki extension, so the, the content is stored as JSON inside MediaWiki. You can view, edit, interact with uh, the content, you know, look at diffs, write abuse filters, um, all that on MediaWiki in the normal way. Uh, the actual kind of front end is written in Vue.js, uh, which gives you a very rich experience for doing complicated things like creating a new input of a particular type that is live created every time you input a, a content and setting a label for it in 12 different languages out of the 500 or 2000 that we potentially support. Then on the back end, uh, we have two services. Uh, one of them, the function orchestrator, which is kind of user-facing potentially, and uh, it's where you can request, hey, I'd like the uh, function to use this piece of data from... I'm Jane Forrester. I'm the lead engineer for Abstract Wikipedia team, working on Wikipedia functions. I've been uh, runs through that. That also has some serializers and deserializers in, in certain cases for depending on your content type, and then pass that all the way back up the stack. That way, uh, you you're not uh, running user written code on the same servers that have access to the databases and things like that. Um, so this kind of separation of concerns, but also and that's kind of our general stack. Hello, everyone. 
My name is Vin. I'm a designer on the Abstract team, currently working on the Wiki functions. And today I would like to share with you a small update on how we're approaching design of Wiki functions. And for the purpose of this update, uh, we're going to look at some of the objects that are currently available on Wiki functions and how the display and how the visualization of this object is going to change following a new design language. So for example, we're going to look at this uh, mushroom object. And um, on Wiki functions, objects, they usually have a custom way to be visualized, but it can happen that certain objects don't have like a custom component to be visualized, so they're going to fall back to a default component. So everything that you see here in this dash line is a default component. Sorry. To be visualized, so they're going to fall back to a default component. So everything that you see here in this dash line is a default component because in this case, this object doesn't have Sorry, I'm trying to screen share again now instead of link, but it doesn't allow me to. Custom component to be used for its own display. And so we can see that this object, uh, mushroom object, has a type, has an identity, has different uh, keys, or you know, we could call them attributes or properties like it has a family, it has a species, it has a genus, and also the creator of this object decided also to add a list of common names. And then here on the right, we see another object, which is uh, this uh, mushroom, type of mushroom, Calbovista subsculpta. And here you can see that the creator used the previously, the previously uh, defined object to visualize uh, or to define what is the family, what are the species, and what's the genus, and what are some common names. And I apologize for what you see here, it's currently a bug, we're working on it, but imagine that you can see a list of common names. And so the way we, we are approaching this is uh, the following. So what we're trying to do is to reduce the amount of information and content available when you land on an object page to its essence and basically display just uh, an overview of the information and then let editors you know go deeper only if they want to so the concept that we're trying to leverage is the progressive disclosure of information through interaction so basically every action of an editor is going to disclose information at their own request and here, for example, you can see our object mushroom. And so at a glance, you can see the type, the identity, the validator, and you can see that also has like four items, four properties. Here you see this uh, Calvarista mushroom using the previously defined object. And you can immediately see at a glance what's its family, the species, the genus, some of its common names. And here on the right, you can see another object that might use another type. In this case, it's a type common, and it's using, uh, and it's defining the title and the author uh, in this case. And so to go a little bit deeper on what we mean with uh, progressive disclosure of information, so it's basically this. Uh, what you see here is a potential flow for navigating this information. So let's say you go to this mushroom object page and you touch or you click if you're on a mouse input or a trackpad input device, this um, row of keys, it will open and it will display what are the keys that are currently available in this object. And then if you would touch or click on a specific key, again, you would go a level deeper and you could navigate, you know, what's the value type, what's the key ID, what's the genus. And as you can see, there's also the language icon and that's because you could access uh, potentially available translations for the specific keys. And in the scenario where uh, key is not available in the same language as the language UI that uh, you have set, 
you're going to see the full text language based on your own preferences or you know navigation history with a dedicated uh, language tag uh, signaling that it's a full text language. So this is how we're approaching design and uh, uh, how we are thinking about you know organizing information in wiki functions. Uh, we'd love to hear your feedbacks and your thought and thank you very much for your attention. Hi, my name is Genoveva Galarza, and I'm a staff software engineer in the Apps Wikipedia team. Uh, my colleague James already gave you a nice introduction on the architecture of Wiki functions, but I wanted to go a little bit in depth into the persistent layer and the concept model. Um, I want to do this because it's ultimately what allows Wiki functions to be a wiki and to collaborate, edit, create uh, objects, but it also is what adds a very big vulnerability ultimately the functions are user contributed code uh, that will be running our service. So that makes it very important. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with the type default content model of Wikipedia, which is called Wikitext. In the case of uh, Wiki functions, the content model is called set object. Um, so MediaWiki offers great tools and abstractions to handle this kind of difference. Um, we do this just a, as a very, very brief technical overview by setting the configuration to say which is the class that is going to be handling this content. And this class is in charge of uh, creating object content, um, but, uh, but it's also in charge of making transformation from one, one way to the other. So for example, um, when, when we are reading uh, stuff from the database and we're sending it to the browser, we will modify that content in, in order to make it readable to the user and create the UI. But also when we um, send data from the front end or from the APIs to, to save it in the database, we'll do validations and transformations and make sure that this, this data is secure. Uh, so what is called content object from the point of view of the function model is what we call persistent object or set to. Now, as an object content is just the JSON file, but this is really heavily structured. And this is an example of it. A uh, persistent object, it just adds a layer, uh, a wrapper around the, the actual object that we're saving so that we can save metadata. This metadata is, for example, uh, an internal identifier or a page name. This identifier is extremely uh, important to keep unedited. So this needs to be remain completely locked and secured once it is created. Uh, I would say that this is our current state right now. When saving as an object, the ID cannot be changed. It's completely forbidden. Uh, and also there's a set of additional validity checks. Like for example, it should be a valid JSON or it should be a valid at all. Uh, but there is a bunch of other things that need to be checked while saving. For example, this other third piece of metadata, which is multilingual identifiers, labels, and aliases. This is free to anyone to edit, to add new labels in new languages. But the actual content, Z2K2, uh, which is what, what contains the, or the function or the type, this uh, should be protected in certain aspects. Some pieces of it um, should not be edited, and some pieces of it are open for edit. Um, now, to illustrate what we are going to be working on in the next um, months, I wanted to create this really silly example called Hackerize. This is a function that transforms Asha Wikipedia into a hacker language word. Um, it's very simple. Now, when I when I do an edit, what, what what I'm sending to the backend is this whole JSON file with a, a number of changes. Uh, all of these changes will be done using a UI, so that the user doesn't have to confront this kind of Z object language. Um, but what the backend is receiving is this this JSON file, and the backend needs to understand what's going on, what changes are happening, and whether those changes are allowed or not. So, as I said before, changing the object ID is completely forbidden. This is fine. Uh, and if I add a new label to the function, this is completely allowed. And anyone is welcome to add uh, labels and aliases to this function. Now, there is four other edits going on on the contents block. What happens with that? There's changes, like for example, changing the argument key that should also be completely forbidden. So if I change uh, uh, the way that an argument is internally referenced, 
every function call that is calling this function would be broken. So this is something that needs to be detected and completely forbidden. Um, but then there's other changes like adding a, a new label to the to the uh, arguments uh, instead of like only having one English label, we'll have two. That is open to every user to contribute. There's other changes, for example, like adding a function tester or adding a function implementation that are allowed, but they're only allowed to uh, privileged users, users that know which testers and which implementations are safe and that are okay after, after reviewing. Um, so all this uh, intricate understanding of the object that is being represented, uh, finding which changes are allowed and finding which changes require certain types of privileges is something that we are going to be working in the next following months. I'm very excited about it. I hope you are too. Um, and keep reading our newsletter because I'm sure we'll be talking a lot about this. Thanks a lot. Wikipedia team. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Wiki functions and how it makes use of a tool called Codex. So hopefully you've seen some of the videos from my colleagues that talk a little bit about what Wiki functions is and how it works. Uh, but for the purposes of this, it is basically uh, the UI or the front end uh, that allows you to interact with functions in the Wikimedia world. So Codex uh, is a toolkit for building user interfaces within the Wikimedia design system. I'm reading this from the screenshot from their documentation. Um, and so it basically contains both the design pieces of, you know, this is how things should generally look and feel. This is how interactivity should generally work, but also um, relevant for, uh, for developing the front end, it has actual view three components. Uh, and so you can see on the left-hand side where this red box is, a list of some of the components that Codex provides for us. And so I like to think of this as things that I might see on any web page that's not super relevant to the functionality of that specific web page. So a button, a checkbox, an icon, things like that. And so what's really nice about using this library, from a developer's perspective, it means that we don't need to write and maintain the code for something that's going to look nearly identical to that of um, another Wikimedia, uh, Wikimedia extension or something like that. Um, and it also means from the Wikimedia perspective that all of the different Wikimedia products will look and feel very similar. So even if you're new to Wiki functions, you don't really know a ton about it, there should be a lot of um, interactions and visuals that, that are familiar to anyone who has used something like Wikipedia. So this is an example uh, from Wiki Functions. So what we're looking at here on the left side is a screenshot from the function page. So I'm viewing a function that's called Echo. Um, and what I'm viewing on the right side is a developer tool, which is a uh, view extension to the Chrome browser. And so the part that I've highlighted in red is a codex component called tabs. Uh, tab container, and then the about is one tab and the details is another tab. And so just to kind of reiterate uh, what I said earlier, what's nice about this is I can grab that component from Codex, and then I actually only have to worry about the parts below, which are very specific to Wiki functions, whereas the way tabs work is not necessarily um, kind of what makes Wiki functions special, and so that part I can sort of abstract away from my application. Um, and so what I'm looking at on the right-hand side is uh, sort of like an under-the-covers Here's how that actually breaks down into individual view components uh, for anyone who's familiar with view. Uh, so what I have here, uh, the CDX stands for codex. So you can see I have this function viewer. That's my component that I'm serving. Uh, and then that pulls in this CDX tabs component, CDX button component, uh, and then the individual tab. Uh, and then from there, I can say uh, to, to the codex component, hey, I want these tabs to be called about in details. And I just want you to route me when, when they click about, I want them to route me here. And when they click details, I want, I want you to route me here. And Codex sort of out of the box will say, okay, this is, you know, this is the line that we have. This is the color that it changes to be, all of that cool stuff. And so this uh, is just even one layer more under the covers, a little bit about what the actual code base looks like. Um, this is part of the Wiki functions code base, which is available online. Um, and so this piece here on the left-hand side is HTML. And so um, on the right-hand side in this little box, you can see how you might actually use Codex in, in an application. You set it up as a dependency, and then you do something like require, quote, at Wikimedia slash Codex dot name of the component you want. So we just looked at tabs. And so I have tabs, which is like 
I want to have a place where lots of tabs will be, and then the individual tab. And so then once I've done this, uh, I can go back to the left-hand side and I can use it like I would any other HTML component. It has particular props that are relevant to it, like the names of the tabs um, and stuff like that, all of which is available on the documentation page. But for my purposes, it works just like any kind of out-of-the-box HTML component. So that's a little look at uh, how Wiki Functions is leveraging some of the cool stuff that um, the foundation has to kind of offer. And uh, Yes, hopefully you enjoy. Hi, my name is Corey Massaro. I'm part of the Abstract Wikipedia team. Uh, I'm here because I'm interested in language and like probably all of us, the democratization of knowledge. Uh, I'd like to present a little bit on a topic that's come up uh, a few times with respect to Abstract Wikipedia. And that's basically a set of questions around belonging, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, this, these questions generally take the form of uh, how do we make sure that when Abstract Wikipedia is, is launched and we're generating articles in a whole bunch of languages, um, the perspective that's being represented uh, is as diverse uh, and inclusive and equitable as the set of languages we support. Um, and there are real challenges to that. Uh, these are known challenges and these, these have been discussed before. Uh, right now, we don't have answers. Uh, if I said we did have answers, you should be worried because that would be a reflection of the same problematic dynamic we're trying to resolve here. Uh, but hopefully we're asking good questions. Um, I recently had the opportunity to do an international arts residency. And while I was there, I got to speak with people from a number of different linguistic backgrounds. Uh, many of them spoke, all of them spoke at least one hegemonic language, but many spoke languages that we would consider under-resourced uh, within the Wikipedia, uh, the Wikipedia project. So this lets me with a lot of ideas. Uh, how can we use Ashley Wikipedia in the future? It also left me with questions uh, to ask uh, and pointed me toward where different aspects of inclusion intersect. Uh, so ultimately, I'm hopeful that uh, we can cultivate partnerships and conversations uh, around these questions with an even broader set of communities. So one thing that came up was about the neutrality of facts. Uh, when I asked people what they would like to share on something on a platform like Abstract Wikipedia, um, people would say things that generally related to where they came from, uh, places where they lived. And this is a little bit challenging because if uh, a place where you've, where you've lived um, has a particular tree or bird that is not threatened, for example, because of a war, or the, the place itself uh, has been in, uh, inalterably uh, terraformed because of war, uh, you're automatically getting into a, a political territory. Um, and so it's it's difficult to get the knowledge democratization right um, because we want to think that uh, knowledge can be neutral and it can be objective, but often that's not the case. Um, but really, these conversations excited me. It means there's a lot to learn about the world. And I wouldn't have learned any of this interesting stuff uh, often sad stuff, but interesting stuff without talking to people whose experiences are vastly different from my own. Um, so this makes me really excited about Abstract Wikipedia. It means, um, you know, what can Abstract Wikipedia do? It can expand access to historically under-resourced languages. That's what we often say it's going to do. But it can also amplify the voices of those languages speakers. Um, selfishly, I want to read and hear more of these kinds of stories. Um, I want to have my own perspective complicated, and I can maybe do that if I have a system like Abstract Wikipedia that lets me read in one of my languages uh, stories and perspectives on knowledge that come from people who do not speak in my languages. Um, so I felt that was interesting. Uh, another thing that came up was uh, a set of questions I had around how people interact with technology. So a lot of the ways people responded to this were pretty expected. You know, um, it's easier or harder to use software in one language or another. Um, if you speak a hegemonic language, obviously the internet opens up greatly. Um, but then I also had a, some conversations that 
ended up being about literacy. Uh, and this is really fascinating because I talked to people who were clearly fluent and literate in multiple languages, uh, multiple hegemonic languages usually, but uh, they also had a language they spoke at home or among friends and didn't read that language. Um, in particular, I met people who spoke uh, Gurmanji, a Kurdish dialect, and, uh, you know, they'd say things like, yeah, when we're talking with our friends, you know, that's all fine. And when we exchange text messages, we send like voice messages, we don't send text. Uh, we even looked at some online corpora of, of poetry and it was really hard to read it. But like if somebody sat there and sounded it out, everybody else could hear it. So that was a really interesting thing to witness. Um, so when I think about how abstract Wikipedia has generally been conceived as a text-based project, um, I'm, I'm reminded always that there's, in, there's, you know, there's a little concern here. Are we going? Um, there, is he, uh, It's trying to restart a video for some reason it lost. Made me hopeful, even though it kind of raises the bar on maybe what we should hope to be able to do with that check Wikipedia. Um, that's my piece. I hope you found it interesting and that we can talk about this. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some contact information shared somehow after this, so please reach out. Hello, I'm Ariel Gutman, a Google Org Fellow for Abstract Wikipedia, working in the Natural Language Generation Workstream. In the previous video, my colleague Corey raised an important question. How do we foster an equitable and diverse abstract Wikipedia? A partial answer lies in the following. We should foster an inclusive and diverse contributor base for abstract Wikipedia, especially among contributors from low resource language communities. This means in particular that we should cater for occasional contributors or contributors who lack programming skills or formal linguistic knowledge. Of course, at the same time, we also want to encourage contributors who want to get more involved or those who have more technical or linguistic skills. What does this mean in the context of NLG, that is, natural language generation? This means that the creation of basic natural language renderers, a key component of abstract Wikipedia, should be as easy as possible, not require any lengthy training, while at the same time, handling complex linguistic phenomena should be made possible for advanced contributors. This can be achieved by modeling renderers using templates. Templates have been used for a long while within the field of energy. In their simplest form, templates can be thought of as text interspersed with placeholders or slots. Let's look at an example. In Wikidata, we can find some information about Marie Curie, such as her date and place of birth. An occasional contributor could write a simple template to render this data, such as the following person who was born on date of birth in place of birth. When we fill the placeholders with the content from Wikidata, we get a sentence such as, Marie Curie was born on the 7th of November, 1867 in Warsaw. At this point, you may want to tell me, come on, this doesn't even work correctly for English, as even the preposition may change in front of certain place names, as the example here shows. In other languages, which regularly exhibit phenomena such as verbal agreement or case assignment, such an approach might not even work for the simplest cases. And indeed, you are right. For this reason, we enhance the template language syntax with the dependency, grammar, annotations. 
Dependency grammar is a linguistic formalism used for describing sentence structure, which can model phenomena such as agreement or case assignment. Our idea is that advanced contributors will be able to correct or enhance simplistic templates with the right annotations in order to get grammatical output, just as seasoned Wikipedians may correct or enhance contribution of occasional contributors. In the example here, you can see that the French template is augmented with subject and mood labels, which will instruct the renderer to enforce subject verb agreement. This permits rendering the sentence Marie Curie est née le 7 novembre 1867 à Varsovie with the correct feminine form of the participle name. If you are interested in more details, you are welcome to read and discuss our proposal on MetaWiki. Stay tuned as well for the upcoming apps of Wikipedia newsletter, which will discuss this proposal. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Ali. I'm a Google.org software engineer fellow working with the abstract Wikipedia team on the Wikifunctions project. I will be presenting the work we are doing on the semantics of Wikifunctions. First of all, what is semantics? In programming language theory, semantics describes how programs should be executed in a particular language. One way to do that is to describe the relationship between the input and output of a program. For example, we can convert temperatures in Celsius to temperatures in Fahrenheit using this function. Take the temperature in Celsius, multiply it by 9, divide by 5, and add 32. Here is how the evaluation could look like for the temperature of the human body. Here, I highlight in each step the part of the program that the evaluation is focusing on. First, we replace the function by its definition and substitute the input value of 37, which gives the second line. Then, we multiply by 37, sorry, we multiply 37 by 9 over 5, which gives 66.6. .6. And finally, we add 32, which produces the result 98.6. We have to be careful in the order in which we do the operations. Everyone knows it would be wrong to add 32 before multiplying by 9 over 5. That would give an incorrect result. This is exactly what semantics is about. By defining precise evaluation rules for the language, we can describe how programs should be evaluated in a correct and unambiguous way. Semantics is not limited to evaluation order. It also describes how variables should be handled and substituted, which terms are considered valid and which ones should produce errors, and more. As you may imagine, in Wikifunctions, this can get quite complex. Not only can we define functions in a native language like JavaScript or Python, but we can also define them by composition, using other functions as building blocks. And each of those other functions can themselves be defined in any way, in JavaScript, in Python, or by composition and even built-ins. We need to carefully orchestrate the evaluation of all these functions in order to get the correct result. By being rigorous in our definition of the function model and its semantics, we can give a precise meaning to all of this and provide a clear definition to which we can refer to. Here is a preview of the evaluation rules we are working on, written in mathematical notation. This work is still in progress, but it has already allowed us to find and correct ambiguities in our model and bugs in our implementation. Thanks for your attention, and we look forward to your questions. Hello all again. Um, the video is also available in the comments and can be viewed there uh, without a translation yet. 
And um, sorry for the technical um, issues that happened at the beginning of the video and in the middle of it. So we have no time for Q&A. We still have um, six or seven minutes um, available. Um, I see a few questions already there. Um, one was, where can I get the weak function spec? And um, the answer is that once we launch, we will, we will make sure that we set up the usual uh, Wikimedia merchandising machine and we will have all the usual uh, merch for Wiki functions with our logo. So um, the team got an early uh, version of this and I'm very happy to, to have it here. Thanks to the community for the logo. Um, it's, it's really growing on us. Second question. May we have a large language model similar to Lambda and others? Um, there's one thing where we're very different in large language models. So in Wiki functions, we use functions to generate natural language text, which means we're using um, basically rule-based systems that say, okay, if you see this, do this and so on, created all by by human developers based on the data in Wikidata for lexicographical entries. We are not using a large language model in the background, uh, which is machine learned and which is doing this automatically. The main reason for that is that those language models are not as editable. One main um, feature of a Wikimedia project is that the contributors, when they see a mistake, should be able to click on the right edit button, fix that mistake, and see it being fixed. This is something we don't know how to do with, uh, with large automatic language models yet. This is why we're using this currently quite um, out of fashion approach of a rule-based natural language generation system. And we are building on decades of knowledge in this area in in order to, to make this happen. But this means um, we will not uh, we will not be providing a language model like this. It also uh, it also means it's not really something that the Wikimedia Foundation would be best poised to do because the text that we have available, well, it's other Wikipedias, and those are not really large enough for the kind of large language models that are currently um, out there, where they usually take the whole web and other sources in order to build them, be it, be it created by Google or DeepMind or Facebook um, or Apple. They're always building on a much larger corpus than just the Wikipedias. So all of this doesn't really put us in the place where we could provide our language model of our own. There are um, open organizations working on, on these kinds of things and we support the work. And we, there are ideas of how to use language models even within the abstract Wikipedia, for example, to choose between two equally um, well-looking alternatives and similar things or to check whether text makes sense and so on. But it's not on our main route for the beginning. Those things will probably be added later as we go on. Next question. I've just found out that labels of object properties like Z10024 mushroom can be translated. However, I try to do the same with Z4 type or Z2 persistent object. Their, pro their properties are not translatable using the normal edit interface. Are the core types properties going to be translatable too? So yes, they will be translatable. Um, they will not be entirely editable, but they, it should be possible to add translations to them. We are still working on the right rights model and on the right um, user's thing. So this is not implemented yet. Um, and this is why you can't do it yet on the better um, properly. But eventually, yes, it will be uh, possible to add and edit labels on the core models, but you won't be able to change the core model um, unless you have the uh, the right rights, which will be quite locked down because a change to the core model can cause a lot of uh, issues. Um, so, how is your time plan holding up? Still launching this year? Well, the original time plan was to launch last year, so uh, it's not long, uh, it's not holding up great. Um, no, um, but things were different than, uh, than we were planning originally. So, um, I really hope 
that I don't want to make any promises. I really hope that the launch will uh, go forth in a not too far future. Um, that we will see in the next few months the the launch. The better that we started last week gives you a view where we are and you will be able to see how we progress to a place that we consider launchable. We will also have a continuous discussion with with the community about what really needs to be in the launch but what doesn't have to be and within the team as well. So um, I don't want and, I, and we never made really a promise about when we will launch. Um, we will get out there when we're ready, but particularly with the uh, Google.org fellows and um, with the new people that are joining our team, I'm confident that the state uh, won't be uh, slip to, slipping too much into the future. So I, I'd rather have you something to use and play with sooner than later. And I think this is a shared um, sentiment on the team. So I'm, I'm pretty confident that you'll have something to play with um, sooner than later. But again, I'm not making a promises about the date. So I'm checking in the etherpad whether there are more questions coming in. Um, just because I already have too many screens, so we're good to find. Oh, we're also at the end of the session time, actually, I'm just seeing. So thanks to everyone for being here. We have monthly uh, volunteer corner, so you come, can come with more questions. You can also reach us on our mailing list and uh, our Telegram and IRC chats. So please feel free to reach out with more, with more questions um, and, if, uh, and take a look at the video again without the technical uh, difficulties, I hope. So thanks everyone for being here. Thanks for the organizers for giving us the opportunity to talk. And um, I'm very excited about uh, how the next few months will look like. Thanks everyone. <laughs>